Good Shabbos and also a Chodesh Tov. We have entered the month of Kislev, a beautiful month, a month where we remind ourselves of the miracles that happened for us in our nation so many years ago. And God willing, may this Kislev this year be another month filled with miracles for us, for our nation, for our congregation, for each one of you individually as well. So this week's parasha is called Parasha Toldot, which is, uh, it means the word generations. And we continue to follow our forefather Isaac and foremother, if that's a word, uh, Rebecca and their journey and their eventual blessing of finally having offspring and having children. God answers their prayers and sends them double trouble. He sends them twins into the womb of Rebecca. And at their birth, we see, well, even before their birth, we see that these two twins have a bit of a wrestling match in the womb. They're what you call bad womb mates. And even at their birth, the wrestling continues, right? As they both come out, we find Yaakov, uh, he's got his brother Esau in a, a heel lock. He's trying to wrestle him in the ankle. But it doesn't stop there. Right? They come out and obviously the one child is uh, almost fully grown, so to speak. He has a full body of hair and his skin is red, which is why we call him Esau and Edom. Right? But even as they grow up, they continue wrestling with each other. Uh, in this week's parasha, they wrestle for the birthright. We'll see later on towards the end of Isaac's life that Esau tries to wrestle it away from Isaac, who originally wrestled it away from Esau when he sold him the bowl of soup. Ironically... When uh, Yaakov was making that soup, he made it red. A ah, little play on words there to talk about Esau. Now, by the way, I'm wearing red today because we're talking about Esau and Edom and uh, getting into the whole mood of the parasha. Later on in the life, they continue wrestling. They're wrestling for the approval of their parents. And the Torah tells us that Isaac loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And then there's even more wrestling about the wives. Who will find a wife that the parents will approve of? And eventually, you know, uh, Rebecca says, I'm so tired uh, to the point of death with these wives of Esau that he got from the Egyptians and all over the place. So the wrestling doesn't end there, by the way. It goes on even beyond this week's parasha, right? Uh, in the upcoming parashas, we're going to follow Jacob on his journeys down to his uncle Laban, where he eventually gets tricked into marrying two wives. But then eventually he comes back and meets up with his brother Esau again, not before spending an entire night wrestling with an angel, who our sages tell us is in fact the angel of Edom, the angel of Esau. And he wrestles with him all night long and eventually says, I will not let go of you until you give me a blessing. And the angel, of course, blesses Jacob and changes his name from Yaakov, which means heel grabber or trickster or Ekev, and changes his name to Yisrael, which means, one of the meanings is, he who wrestles with God. So even in that point, we still see Jacob wrestling. But the wrestling match between Israel and Edom doesn't stop with Jacob and Esau. In fact, this whole wrestling match between the nation of Israel and the nation of Edom continues for centuries and centuries. We have a long and arduous history with the Edomites who are constantly a thorn in our side. So today I want to share with you guys a story from the Gemara, a story from the Talmud. It's story time about one of Esau's descendants who thousands of years later ends up almost stealing and destroying the ultimate fulfillment of that promise that was made to Abraham, which was passed down through the firstborn right that we read about in this week's parasha. That wrestling match continued thousands of years later. So, here we are today in the month of Kislev. Around the corner is Chanukah, where we remind ourselves of the story of the Hasmoneans. The Hasmoneans who fought back against the Greeks. Remember, the Greeks took our temple and defiled it. They made an unkosher Greek salad inside there. And then the Hasmoneans came, took it back, cleansed the temple, Chanukah Habayis, and we rededicated that temple through the miracle of the lamp and the burning menorah for all eight days and eight nights. Now, the Hasmoneans, after this wonderful story of Hanukkah that we're going to commemorate later this month, eventually the Hasmonean dynasty faded away and was replaced, usurped, by none other than a descendant of the Edomites, a descendant of Esau, by the name of King Herod, Herod the Great. King Herod, of course, was uh, an Edomian, which is just a Roman way of saying he was an Edomite, a literal descendant of Esau himself, as red as they come. So the Midrash actually tells us an interesting thing about Esau and how we should look at Esau. In the Midrash Rabbah, Rav Yochanan tells us that the text this week 
is pointing out the intentions of Esau even while he is in the womb. It uses a Hebrew word, the Hebrew, the Hebrew word Vayisrotsetsu, which Rav Yaakov tells us is actually, uh, sorry, it's Rav Yochanan. Rav Yochanan tells us is actually two Hebrew words used together. The first Hebrew word is the word to run, the word rates. And then he adds to that the word retzutz, which means to crush. So it tells us that what Esau was doing in the womb when Rebekah was feeling more than just a heartburn, right, was that Esau was running around the womb trying to crush the pre-born Yaakov because he knew that there would be a wrestle for in the future between his descendants and Yaakov's descendants as to who would be the true inheritor of this blessing that God has brought into the world through the descendants of Abraham. So even before he was born, when there were still babies in the womb, Esau was trying to kill Jacob or trying to make it uncomfortable for Jacob. And then, of course, you know, Rebecca had to go find out, my God, why am I thus? What's going on? Is this really, do I have to suffer this much? Is this really necessary? And God explains to her, there are two nations in your womb, and the elder shall serve the younger. Esau didn't hear that message, right? His ears were closed at that stage. Uh, there's actually another commentary that says that Esau, of course, you know, the Torah tells us when he was born, he was a full body of hair already. So the, the, the commentators tell us that Esau in the womb was already rubbing up his uh, prickly hair all over his body against uh, Jacob while they were in there. And that was causing the discomfort. You can only imagine what that must feel like. But alas, Baruch Hashem, we know how the story turned out. Esau failed at killing his pre-born twin brother. Even though he does later in life try to do it again when he finally finds out that the birthright goes the other way. Now, back to King Herod, his descendant. 2,000 years later, Herod, the descendant of Esau, tries the, almost the exact same thing. To once again kill off the seed of Jacob at its birth. Because as we know from the Gospel story, Herod tries to kill all the babies in the city of Bethlehem so that he can attain for himself the title King of Israel. Now, I want to tell you guys the background story as to what happened in those days that led up to that occurrence. So here is story time. Make yourself comfortable. Get some popcorn. So when King Herod came into power, our uh, Sanhedrin was, he uh, was headed by a wonderful personality known as Bava ben Buta. So they said to him, hey Buta, you can be in charge. Bava ben Buta, this wonderful, wonderful guy, uh, filled with wisdom. He was extremely wise. And everyone would go to him with their questions. In fact, I think the Aramaic name Bava actually means like father. He was a father to everyone. That's how wise he was. People would ask him questions, every question under the sun. They would say, Bava ben Buta, when is it Rosh Hadesh? When is the new moon coming? They would say, Bava ben Buta, do we make a tithe on herbs from our own garden? You know that story from uh, Yeshua talking about how the Pharisees would tithe mint, dill, and cumin? They asked that to Bava ben Buta. They would ask Bava ben Buta, what should a person do to keep himself from sinning in the first place? And they would ask Bava ben Buta, when is the Mashiach ben David, when is Messiah son of David, finally going to arrive? And Bava replied to them, well, if I knew that, I would be the Mashiach ben David himself. I don't know. But I can tell you this, he should be here soon. He will arrive any minute now. Remember that this time, Judaism was ripe for the coming of Messiah. Everything was in place for the Messiah to come and save the nation from those evil Romans that are now taking over them and punishing them. So seeing the wisdom of the sage Bava ben Buta and how he answered everyone's questions, King Herod also approached him with a few questions of his own. I mean, if you've got this uh, wise guy in town, you might as well take a few shots at him and see if he can help you out. Now, remember that King Herod... He had what you know, let's call it a semi-conversion to Judaism. He wasn't a, a naturally born Jew, right? Uh, just a generation earlier, there was a guy by the name of John Hyrcanos, one of the Hasmoneans, who eventually went and forcibly converted a bunch of Edomians to, Ju to Judaism. And these Edomians, you know, they might have been converted to Ju Judaism, but they didn't know anything about Judaism. Even afterwards, they still stayed unkosher. They didn't know anything about the Torah themselves. They were just, you know, forcibly converted to Judaism. And it caused us a lot of distress. But this idea 
of Herod being a king over this Jewish nation was something that stuck with him to the point where he was completely obsessed with being called the king of the Jews. So he called up Baba Ben Buddha, the wisest man of, him, of them all, right? He first went to his mirror mirror on the wall and asked who's the wisest of them all. And it was Baba Ben Buddha. And he asked Baba Ben Buddha this question. What does the Torah mean when it says in Deuteronomy that a king of the Jews must be from your brethren? What does that specifically mean? Now, Baba Ben Buddha, being the wise guy that he is, realized that if he gives him the answer immediately, that would be the start of hell breaking loose. So he tells King Herod, Ooh, this is a very wise question you thought of there, your, your majesty. It's so difficult, in fact, that even I, a wise guy myself, will need to go home and study it before I can present you with an answer. Give me some time and I will get an answer and come back to you with an answer. And King Herod said, oh, yeah, I'm glad you recognize the, 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 <laughs> the smartness of my question. And he gave him a few days. But then before Baba Ben Buddha could even uh, figure out how he's going to save the nation from this, uh, this wicked King Herod, King Herod approached him again. This time as Baba Ben Buddha was sitting with the rest of the Sanhedrin. And King Herod asked the question again, what does it mean when the Torah says that the king of Israel must be from your brethren? And before Baba Ben Buddha could stop anything, someone in the Sanhedrin said to King Herod, it means that the Messiah must be a literal descendant of David. He must be Jewish. When the Messiah, son of David, comes, he will be a Jew born from the tribe of Judah, not a convert. Now Herod, of course, he didn't like this answer because he wasn't a descendant of David. He wasn't a descendant of the tribe of Judah. He was a convert. So what did he do when he heard this bad news that he didn't want to hear? He put the entire Sanhedrin to death. Except for one person, he kept Bava ben Buddha. He reasoned that, you know, you need to keep one of them around to answer his uh, burning questions. And Bava ben Buddha is supposed to be the wisest of them all. But to punish the old sage, Bava ben Buddha, who was the only survivor of that Sanhedrin, he would have his eyes gouged out. Not just in any regular manner, but what he did actually was he took a porcupine hide and turned it inside out and pushed it into the head of Bava ben Buta so that he had the, the quills of the porcupine sticking out from his head. Kind of like a crown of thorns, which is quite an interesting thought. And this is, by the way, this is why I thought of the story this week when I was reading the parasha and reading about Isaac, who was the first person in the history of the Bible to actually go blind. And this week, I'm um, telling you guys the story of Bafa ben Buta, who also went blind for the remainder of his life, at a time when there was a crown of thorns in play as well. So Herod again tried to catch Bafa ben Buta out one day. This time, of course, Bafa ben Buta was blind and there was a new Sanhedrin in place. And King Herod snuck into the room with Bafa ben Buta and changed his voice. He spoke with an accent uh, and he tried to... What's the word? pretend he tried to put on the disguise, which is also something that we see a lot in this week's parasha, people wearing disguises, he put on a disguise to try and look like a commoner uh, starting a new conversation with Bava ben Buta. And he tried to get Bava ben Buta to say something bad about himself, about King Herod, without him realizing that it was King Herod himself talking. So King Herod said to him line after line after line of trying to say something bad about King Herod, but Baba ben Buta constantly used scriptural sources, proof from the text of the Bible, to say that we are not allowed to say anything bad about a king or a leader of our nation. Eventually, Baba ben Buta said to him, uh, quoting from the Tanakh from Ecclesiastes 10.20, that uh, if you curse a king or even a rich man, a bird from the heavens will carry that sound and that winged creature will make the matter known. I think that's the origins of the Afrikaans saying like the folky were flat. So he knew that he couldn't do that. And uh, Baba ben Buddha, you know, he answered him so eloquently and so brilliantly that he actually changed Herod's uh, emotions. Herod thought to himself, I've given this guy every opportunity to say something bad about me and he keeps 
defending my office as king of Israel. And at that moment, tradition tells us, Herod felt sorry for what he had done to the previous Sanhedrin by putting them all to death. And he asked Bavad ben Buddha, what can I do to make up for their loss? I've got this feeling of remorse. What can I do today to make up for killing the Sanhedrin? And Bava ben Buddha in his wisdom said to him, when you killed the sages of our Sanhedrin, it was like you killed the light of the world. That's a term that's used to refer, by the way, in the New Testament, it's used to refer to disciples of Yeshua. To great sages, they are the light of the world. They reveal the light and the glory of God to those around them. They are a shining light to our generation. So he said to him, because you have killed or extinguished the light of the world, why don't you now remodel the temple? Because the temple itself is also referred to in the Torah as the light of the world. In fact, Yeshua has got uh, this teaching where he teaches his disciples about this, the same thing, you know, where he takes all of these different uh, times in the Torah where it re refers to the term light of the world, whether it be through people, whether it be through himself, whether it be through the temple, as the light of the world. Right? We know that verse, you are the light of the world, let your light shine bright before all men, that they may see your deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So this is the deal that he says to Herod. He says to Herod, you've extinguished the light of the world for killing the sages. Now reignite the light of the world by remodeling our temple. And Herod thought, this is a great idea. And this is, of course, how it happened that uh, Herod remodeled the temple. Right? It's almost a happy ending, but not quite. It's got something else to tell you about. As the days went on, eventually a day came when Herod again needed the counsel of the Sanhedrin, and he went to go ask his favorite sage, Baba Bimbuta, to interpret something for him. Because there was a different light of the world that came to bother Herod. It was the birth of the Messiah. The Gospels tell us the story of the Magi who came from the east when they saw the star in the sky, and they said, ah, oh, look, it's they didn't say Christmas time, they said it's Hanukkah time. We better bring some gifts to Jerusalem, to the Messiah. Give him a Hanukkah gift. And they came to Jerusalem asking, where is the Messiah who was born? We saw it written in the stars. Herod, of course, naturally saw this as a problem, right? Just look at how he reacted last time he asked the Sanhedrin about the Messiah, Ben David. He went and killed them all. This time he does a similar thing. He goes back to the Sanhedrin and he asks Bava ben Buta, what does the Torah say? What is the interpretation? Where will the Messiah be born? And Bava ben Buta, of course, tells him, based upon Micah chapter 5, verse 1, that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem. And what does Herod do? Herod sends his soldiers to kill all the babies in Bethlehem. Similar to Pharaoh, of course, but also similar to what we see the Midrash tells us about Esau, his ancestor in this week's parasha, trying to kill the baby Jacob before they were even born. And for good measure, Herod somehow has his soldiers go and destroy all the family records of the descendants of David as well. He has that burnt completely as well, because he is so obsessed with being the only one who can have this title, King of Israel. Herod tried to steal the Davidic kingship for himself, very much like his ancestor Esau. You see, you might get confused if I tell you that Esau stole the birthright. It doesn't sound like it when you read this week's parasha, right? But if you think about it, Esau did try and steal the birthright after he already sold it, right? Because when he was younger, he sold it to his brother for a bowl of soup. He was bowling for soup. And uh, what happened? When Isaac was about to die, he was already blind, he said to Esau, go prepare for me game the way that I like it, so that I can give you the firstborn blessing. Now Esau, knowing that he sold the firstborn blessing, should have said to his father, if he was a righteous man, should have said, sorry father, I have sold that blessing to my brother Yaakov. It's his. But instead, what does Esau do? He stays mum, he keeps quiet, and he says, sure thing, I'll be right back with the biltong. And he wants to steal the blessing from his brother Jacob. So Jacob is not a bad guy in the story here. Not at all. He wanted to do exactly the same thing that Herod is doing in the story. He wanted to steal the kingship of Israel for himself. Now the story does eventually have a happy ending. Towards the end of Herod's life, 
obviously we see Messiah uh, at that stage. Messiah escapes down to Egypt as well. And after a few years when Herod dies, Messiah comes back. But how did Herod die? Well, towards the end of Herod's life, he wanted to ensure that the people would actually mourn for his death when he dies. But he realized the people don't really like him. So what cunning plan could he come up with to get everyone to mourn at his death? He had the Sanhedrin jailed and he told his guards, the day that I die, you are to kill the entire Sanhedrin so that the whole nation of Israel will mourn on the day that I die. And it will look as if they are actually mourning for my death. But when he did fall ill and die eventually, Fortunately, there was a sister of his, uh, let's call her a righteous sister, Salome the first. Salome didn't like him that much. And she went and told the guards a little lie, saying, oh, Herod didn't die, he's feeling much better. In fact, he gave me an order to tell you guys to free the Sanhedrin and let the rabbis go. And Herod died and our Sanhedrin was freed. So Herod passed away and Israel rejoiced and the Messiah lived. What a joyous day for Judaism like we haven't seen in years. Now, in saying this though, you know, Bava ben Buta, who's been through a lot in his life, right? He would be overjoyed at this, right? He knew that he told Herod where the Messiah is. And Herod said, ah, oh, great, now I know where he is. I'm going to go kill him. Bava ben Buta must have been worried. Oh no, have I given away? Have I given away the place of Messiah? Have I been just like Daniel? There's this whole discussion in the Talmud about how Daniel did the same thing by advising Nebuchadnezzar and he got punished for it. Will I be punished for revealing where the Messiah is? But he was joyous that he was able to survive. But even in saying that though, blind old Baba ben Buddha still wasn't able to recognize Yeshua as the Messiah. And I look at the story that I just told you as a manifestation, almost of, prophetically, of this week's parasha. Because in Jewish Talmudic tradition, Esau and the nation of Eden became a symbol for Christianity. It only happened at the time of this story about Herod, though, right? Before then, no one ever, there was no such thing as Christianity, of course, right? Uh, so that actually only happened after this time of Herod that, uh, that Christianity was seen as Esau or Edom. Obviously, Rome was not the literal descendants of Esau, but they started seeing Rome as, spiritually speaking, they were now the Edomites. They were this red army that came to take us away and destroy our temple. And that, that makes sense, right? Because the people resented the Roman Edomite tyrant Herod, who we just learned about, that persecuted them so harshly. And henceforth, it was easy for the sages to spill their wrath upon Edom and their progenitor Esau himself. Esau became a symbol of the Roman oppressor. Esau and Edom were actually used as code words when they were speaking disparagingly about Rome to avoid alarming authorities as who they were really talking about. Uh, the code words, right? So they wouldn't get caught out. It's the same with the 666. That's also a code word for Rome as well. So indeed, when the sages would speak about the evils of Esau, they were often really referring to the evils of the Roman Empire. It is therefore not surprising that Esau becomes possibly the most reviled character in the entire Torah, just as the Romans were unquestionably the most reviled entity in Talmudic times. And that's why there's so much talk in the Talmud about Esau and Edom being Rome. And that eventually carried over into the future as Christianity. Because remember, the Roman Empire eventually, much later, converted to Christianity. And they took up Christianity as their national religion. And uh, you look at this and uh, it's quite ironic that the Christianity that Rome went and took, which is not Messianic Judaism as we practice it, right? But the Christianity that Rome took eventually went and claimed to be a replacement for the nation of Israel. They were the very first uh, replacement theologians. They practiced replacement theology, saying that we have replaced the nation of Israel and we have taken their firstborn blessing. Exactly like what we see Esau doing in this week's parasha. Stealing the firstborn right from who deservedly was supposed to have it. Yaakov, the nation of Israel. But where does that leave us? Messianic Jews and Gentiles who claim Yeshua as the Messiah. And we read the Talmud and we read all the commentaries 
since the Talmudic era up until now, where Judaism, our brothers, our cousins, are referring to Christianity or even to us, Yeshua, as Esau, as Edom. Do we want to be Edomites? Can we call ourselves Esau? Well, in a way, actually, yes, but not in the way that you would think. Not in the way that you would think would be associated with Edom and Esau. The fact that God has allowed the message of Yeshua and the gospel message, the message of the light of the world, to spread to all corners of the earth through the agent of Christianity is actually quite intriguing. That God allowed it to happen. That Christianity would be the bearer of the message of Yeshua. Why would God do that? It's an amazing thing. Because Messiah, through this whole uh, cover-up, so to speak, is actually dressed up as Esau for a certain purpose. What is the purpose? The same purpose that Jacob in the switch parasha dresses up as Esau. With the goat hair arms and he wears the cloak of Esau that smells like the Garden of Eden. In order to get the blessing as the angel prophesied to Rebekah in the first place. So what's the purpose of Messiah being concealed in this guise of Esau? The enemy of Israel? What's the purpose of Messiah being so concealed from the Jewish nation? So that the light of the world could shine forth to the ends of the earth, to all nations, so that the fullness of the Gentiles could come in. You see in the story, Bava ben Buddha actually quotes a verse from Isaiah 2 verse 2. He says, at the end of days, this mountain in Jerusalem, Mount Maria, will be raised up above the others, and all nations will stream to it. And he actually makes a play on words there. Because the Hebrew word there for stream, so that all the nations will stream to it, is the word venoharu, uh, sorry, venoharu. But he says we should rather read the word as nehora, meaning light. That the light of Messiah will draw all the nations from every corner of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the one true God. So while the Messiah is in disguise, while Judaism today refers to Christianity as the Edomites or the house of Edom or the descendants of Esau, the Gentiles will see the light of the world and draw near to Jerusalem until the day when the Messiah does return and finally reveal himself. He takes off that fake goat hair. He takes off this coat of Esau that he's been wearing for the last 2,000 years. And he reveals himself to his brothers. Like Isaac in this week's parasha. Eventually he sees, oh my gosh, I just gave the blessing to Jacob. It must be right because this is from Hashem. He, the blessing must stay upon Jacob. Just like in the parashas that are coming up. When Joseph... He's also in disguise to his other 11 brothers and reveals himself to them saying, Ani Yosef, I am Joseph, your brother. And they are in shock when they realize who their brother actually is, that he has become their redeemer. And Paul tells us this exact same thing in Romans chapter 11 verse 25. Forgive me for using the New King James Version here, but I want to use it because there's a word that it uses uh, to remind ourselves about the blindness of uh, Isaac and the blindness of Bava Bebuta. It says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So this week's parasha of Isaac's blindness, of the struggle for the birthright and the disguise of Jacob in the facade of Esau, eventually plays out on the largest scale possible to allow for the revelation of Messiah and the promises made to Abraham to come to fruition where all nations will be blessed through the seed of Abraham. I wish you all a Shabbat Shalom and a Chodesh Tov.